Now, Birmingham has had a long history of using its old service vehicles um, as maintenance vehicles. And um, this is the permanent way yard in Henley Street uh, near Knotts Lake Road uh, works and was the, situated adjacent to the Birmingham Worcester Canal. At one time, materials were delivered to the yard by canal. Um, this shows the rail grinder uh, public works car 10 in the yard in 1939. It was originally a City of Birmingham tramways car. It became Tramcar 508 when transferred to Birmingham Corporation and then converted to a works car in November 21. This is permanent way department's car number one, converted from a sand van in 1924 for over inspection work on the reserve track sections. It was photographed at Selly Oak Depot in November 1938. It was fitted with two trolley poles which were mounted so that it could be used in either on either wire on the double track sections without fouling the tower. So the idea was, of course, if they were going that way, they used that pole. And then if they were going that way, they'd use that one. So it meant they hadn't got the fiddle that the um, ordinary tram drivers had of having to run around the tram and, and re-hook the pole on. Um, they could just put them straight and made it easier. Um, top left is a rail grinding car, which later became number four works car number six, photographed again at Knotts Lane uh, Road Yard in 1910. The car was in all over blue livery, except for the cab windows, uh, window frames, with the fleet and department name in gold shaded letters. Um, pair of sixes truck came from a steam tram locomotive. Note the cu coupled wheels. The car had only one electric traction motor, but a second motor drove the rail grinding equipment. The cow catcher um, type lifeguard were quite unusual um, on, on these tram cars. And I must admit, I never ever saw any trams with this type of um, cow catcher. Uh, whether it's because it was originally um, a steam loco, I don't know. Uh, top right, permanent way car number eight. Uh, photographed at Perry Bar Terminus in about 1938. The rail grinder car was built from the lower deck of a tram car 266, a former illuminated car, and the truck uh, of an ex-CBT company car 505. And the and is pictured in the, in the lined out Colbert blue, which was standard for most works cars until 1948. Bottom left, uh, permanent way car number nine, photographed in, uh, in the later unlined blue and cream livery on the entrance of Miller Street. This permanent way yard. Uh, in order to get into the yard, cars had to negotiate this, uh, this reserve curve in rather a narrow Miller, Miller Street. Bottom right, this photograph shows one of two cars used for carrying sand and sets um, to track repair sites, in particular sand cars. Um, this particular sand car is pictured in Miller Street Permanent Way Yard in 1938. These cars were former, were familiar sites at night um, after the last passenger cars had returned to their depots. One of these cars would be seen pulling a train of flat wagons along the street. The last wagon would be carrying a lighted brazier, which would serve as a real light. The brazier was also probably used for brewing, for brewing up purposes by the track gang. A lot of um, different types of ma maintenance vehicles uh, required. Um, 
in this picture, um, tramcar 662 uh, was broken down, uh, and the um, recovery vehicle, which was a cut down AEC bus, um, is being used to uh, rescue it. So these guys are un unloading a special bogey um, to be put under the tram. So this is the next stage of um, getting the bogey off the trailer. Um, well, I should say, yeah, that's right, jockey bogey off the trailer, um, ready to uh, put it under the tram. And if you look, they've actually taken the guards away from under the tram so they can push this underneath. Um, the jockey bogey is pushed under the tram car whilst the tram car is jacked up off the off the track and the tram is then lowered and the weight of the tram rests on the jockey bogey. Tram 662 was then pushed by pushed to Knotts Lane Road Works by a sister, by a sister tram car which was waiting uh, on the track behind it. So these the bogies now are not actually on the track at all. This is this has got the whole of the way. So that was to stop it breaking the axle or anything else and parts of the traction. And um, illuminated vehicles were very common for to, for special occasions, and this one the tram car was illuminated um, for the Silver Jubilee of King George V and Queen Mary. Um, it was decked in lights and decorations and carried an illuminated message, God bless our King and Queen, uh, our King and Queen Silver Jubilee. Then there's, of course, the, um, the coronation in 1937. So again, tram car was uh, all decked out um and it actually featured a crown on top of it um of course safety was one of the uppermost things on the minds of uh, any operator even in these days so we had the different guards on on the trans um to protect them from protect pedestrians from getting caught underneath them and then, the t then, of course, the trams were tested to see how stable they were. And the tilt test was primarily used to check the stability of the vehicle. And any public service um, should not fall over unless it tilts over 45 degrees. And as far as I know, this rule still applies to all the modern buses as well. It's, it's applied to the, the buses of this period. Uh, tram car 304 was being tested to see what angle it reached before it would actually triple, triple, topple over. Uh, this test was being carried out after a sister tram, which is featured at the back there, 323, two, three, had toppled over. Um, the car 304 uh, has chains wrapped around her, so that when she actually starts to fall over, she's stopped from falling over completely. Apparently, tram car 323 three had turned over outside Aston Church, in May 1932, a short time before the photograph was taken. Unfortunately, the tram car was so it was never used again in service and she'd broken up for spares as deemed, deemed unrepairable. Uh, the lifeguard and tray, which were designed to stop pedestrians falling under the trams uh, and under the bogies, that's what I mentioned there. So that's the remains of uh, what's wrong button. Um, at a time time of the accident of this accident, temporary single line working was taken up in operation in Saltley Road due to sewer excavations. Uh, while the city brand car seven eight two was stopped at Nietzsche's place, waiting to enter in single line section, it was hit by tram car seven seven six, also bound for the city, and pushed 
forward, causing it to strike a glancing blow to tramcar 791 approaching from the city, uh, direction over the single track. Um, surprisingly, there were no derailment, but the rear of tramcar 782 and the leading end of tramcar 776 were damaged um, to the plat were damaged to the platform and canopies. Both tram cars were cr um, were crowded with 65 passengers. Uh, passengers received minor injuries and shock, although no one was detained in hospital. All after, after, the, after the at the inquiry that followed, it was revealed that the motorman of tram car 776 had suffered a slight uh, epileptic seizure. The three tram cars were repaired shortly afterwards and went back into service. I had to laugh when I looked at this picture and saw it was 776 because in my younger days when I was on a motorbike, I smacked into the back of a double-decker bus. My excuse was, I couldn't think of anything better to say at the time, was the fact I didn't see it. Um, and the driver just could not understand why I did not see a double-decker bus, but its number was 2776. And I thought perhaps it's something about that number that it gets bashed into. Um, on November, on 29th of November 1920, a Dudley, a, a Dudley established tram um, was descending Castle Hill. If anybody knows Castle Hill at Dudley, <laughs> they can kind of understand this. Uh, when it skidded on greasy rails and careered down the gradient at up to 40 miles an hour, leaving the rails at, by Dudley Opera House, it hit a car, mounted the pavement and came to a halt with the front third hanging over the bridge over the Dud above Dudley Station, which was a 60-foot drop. This was seen from the top of a tram held up by accident. The motorman conductor and 14 passengers escaped the crash with shock, but something made the helpers on the scene think that the accident was far more serious. The car the tram hit, tram car hit, was loaded with bones, uh, which was probably on its way to a glue factory. So you can imagine the people rushing to help and then finding tons and tons of bones on the ground. We wonder what on earth had happened. <coughs> Sorry, forgot to press the button again. Um, another accident, this tram car 22 operated by the city of Birmingham tramways uh, was going downhill at Warstock Lane in the jewellery quarter area of the city. The brakes of the tram failed and it ran away. At the junction of Warstone Road Lane and Icknell Street, the tram overturned at high speed and skidded along and, and skidded until it stopped on the other side of the streets, smashing into the pavement. Two people died and 17 were, were, in, were injured in the accident. The tram's brakes were examined after the crash and found to be faulty. So as a result of the accident, all brakes on the city trams were made safer. Um, the top left view, we've got the basic trolley wheel. Um, bottom left is a bird's eye view of the boat collector fitted to one of the tram cars operating on Washford Heath, uh, Wash on the Washford Heath and Allen Rock route. Um, the bow collector had certain advantages over the trolley wheel in that it caused less wear on the overhead wire. The bow collector was not easily dewired and did not require reversing at a terminus. It simply swung over uh, to trail in the new direction when the tram car reverse, res, res, reversed. The centre photo is a bird's eye view of the trolley wheel and arm and the roof supports on the tram car. Far right, the 8th of August 1949, Cantra, Cantra, sorry, tram car 347 on Route 60 at Aston Cross. The conductor is reconnecting the trolley pole onto the overhead cable. Um, after Birmingham Corporation suffered heavy losses 
to the fleet in April 1941, the Transport Department introduced a policy of nighttime dispersal of some of the fleet. Um, this, the photograph was taken at Trinity Road Football Loop in Witten and uh, being used uh, to store 18 trams. Sorry, I forgot to press the buttons. Um, this was common practice um, right up until, um, I don't know whether it was still going on in the 1960s, but it was certainly going on in the late 50s where they would still leave vehicles parked along the side of the road at, at night and they were never touched. Children didn't go and vandalize them or try and drive off in them. They, they were left alone, which I always found with the way things are today, that um, it was quite, quite surprising. Um, so during the war, they lost 26 trams. Um, five were damaged, but they, but they only lost six buses, which I find strange, but, um, and eight buses were damaged and repaired and back in service. Now, I think part of this was the, um, the state the tram fleet was in because it was being run down anyway. So it was not being serviced properly. So probably as other tram cars were destroyed, part of it was probably because they were in a bad maintained state anyway. I'm doing this again, pressing the wrong button. Um, this is the only photo I managed to, to obtain a bomb damage to a tram depot. Um, and this is um, Miller Street. And um, it shows quite extensive damage um, to the building. Um, and I managed to find some, some photographs of the bus garages. Um, when, you, when you sort of listen to the losses of the buses, it, it, it seems rather strange. But um, if I remember rightly, we were give, there were a pile of buses destined for, for Africa, um, which were about to depart when war broke out and these buses were dispersed into the, in, back into the country. And I think Birmingham City got quite a large proportion of this particular fleet. Um, that's um, Highgate Road bus garage. And then um, this is uh, a Daimler um, bus, which got uh, the wrong side of um, a bomb. Um, I can't remember now if this vehicle was actually totally written off. Um, probably somewhere in the archive I've got the information about this. And um, Hockley bus garage. Now, I actually met the man who was first on scene when this happened, when the bomb hit the garage. He said they heard the bomb come down. And when they heard the bang, they said straight away, we've lost the garage. And he was the first man on the scene because he lived just up the road from Hockley Garage. We were actually rewiring his house at the time. Um, and um, he said that the manager of the garage had had this weird idea of rearranging the buzzes around the garage in a peculiar pattern so that if they were bombed they wouldn't get the buzzes wouldn't be badly damaged brilliant idea except that they um the most of the damage apparently was towards the doorway which meant they couldn't get any buzzes out because of the way in which they'd been arranged um so this garage suffered quite badly as well Of course, trams had to operate in the winter, and this is tram car 333 and um, 358 outside Selly Oak uh, Depot in 1939, and they're fitted with snow plows. So they've taken the, um, the guard off and they put snow plows on. So they've actually removed the lifeguards, and of course there's a snow plow on both ends. And this is quite interesting because this method of using snowplows on uh, public transport vehicles was still being used in the 1960s um, when we didn't have council snowplows um, to clear the roads. The bus companies did it themselves. So um, 
what you always hoped was that when you were going to work on his stove, that you were able to get on the bus that was going behind the one with the snow plow on. And what they did with the buses was it was an, an out of service vehicle uh, with the maintenance crew um, with a whole pile of bags of sand on the platform to weigh the back wheels down and a plow between the front and back wheels. Um, quite an efficient way of doing it. So, of course, we had the winter of 47, which the only reason why I can remember it was uh, my dad caught pneumonia. He was only ever off work twice, to my knowledge, in his working life, and that was one of them. And I can't remember the snow, but I remember dad being ill. Um, just to add insult to injury after the war, we had the great freeze up of 47. Uh, tram cars line up in High Street, Aston, whilst tram car 6698 uh, six, is pushed in order to break the ice on the rails. 689's uh, motorman leans out to monitor the progress that has been made. Uh, the car, cars parked on the side of the road appear to have been abandoned. Tram car 62. Um, 262 is fitted with a snow plow, which is required, which required the lifeguard, as I said earlier, removing. Um, right, so that's how we got through the winters. And then, of course, the last day comes. Um, the official last day of the trams, uh, number 16616, passes tram car 623 the 4th of July, 1953, uh, the last morning of tramway operation in Birmingham. I wanted to go and see that, but my dad wouldn't let me go because I was only five. Uh, no, I wasn't only five. I was, I was older than that, wasn't I? Yeah. I was eight. Right. Now, it, it, these are the trams that have gone for scrap, and I, I spent some time sort of looking at them and thinking, why do they look odd? Um, and then it dawned on me, they're the upper decks. So they, they've taken the top decks off and dumped them one on top of another. And, and this was at the yard at WT Bird and Sons and strapped by Maven. And then, of course, we had our last tram car, our official last tram car that was preserved. So this is looking back at the final abandonment and of tram cars by Birmingham. The department had been on the whole highly professional, meticulous, business-like, and yet cautious, careful and thorough. Um, the engineering department was seemingly completely empirical, ba basing its practices on excellent craftsmanship and maintenance schedules employed employed in tried and tested situations. Imaginative designers or theoretically qualified engineers seem to have been absent from the corporation's payroll. Body styles in particular changed little over the years. And the last production batch re reassembled and the first resembled the first batch Saying, sorry, I'll say that again. The last production batch, batch in 1929 resembled the first of the 1904 to a remarkable degree. And the disinterested passenger in the lower saloon of one of the earlier trams, um, after it had been updated, would have been put to some difficulty to, to describe the differences from the 29 car. And... This is the example of the first and last trams. And there is very little difference in the period, in the design. It hardly changed. Right, we had the upper saloon covered in. Um, the stairs were changed. Um, but in essence, everything else safety rails and everything else the, the windows were changed obviously but really outwardly very little change at all and i i thought that, that was the end of birmingham trams i thought the only tram that we got left was the one that was originally in the science museum and is now in the stink tank 
and then I came across this um, tram. Sorry, I'm ahead of myself somewhere. I've got my pages mixed up, or have I gone? Hang on, just let me check. Can I just go back to previous? No, it's all right. I'm, I've got my pictures in the wrong order. No, just, just bear with me while I get myself pressed to the right buttons. So, the undertaking, um, the undertaking sheer size with its economic strength and bargaining power, which um, accompanied it, would have made it difficult for the system to be unsuccessful least during the, the golden age of tramway systems. Smaller systems were unable to reduce it until uh, reduce until costs to Birmingham's levels, whilst a large float of tram cars enabled thorough overhaul procedures to be enforced. Add to this the high quality materials and general specifications and the success of the system was assured. Although the caution, patience and shrewdness to Birmingham managers the citizens of Birmingham enjoyed an extremely reliable, cheap and frequent tram car service. If the citizens of Birmingham noticed a, a stagnation in the design, they didn't worry about it. Right, so I've got myself sorted now. So, like I was just saying, I thought this was the end of the trams. Um, uh, all the West Merrick tram car allocation in service at the closure of the Dudley and Spirit routes uh, was stored at the, at the depot in case the route was to be reinstated. The decision to scrap the 71 class cars was taken in December 1939 and they were sold to Cashmore's of Great Bridge. However, the lower deck saloon of two cars uh, escape this fate. Tramcar 107 was used as a summer house in Charnford near Bromsgrove. Which, so on the left, it was 1st of April 1988. It was acquired for preservation by Aston Manor Museum and resides in the Aldridge um, Transport Museum at Shenston Drive, Northgate, Aldridge. Um, the centre is coronation of George the the fourth took place in 1937 and many places including Albury put up bunting and flags to celebrate the event. Tramcar 107 uh, travels across the open space of the market on its way towards the narrow entrance of the street. Right, is, uh, its restoration is on the museum's wish list. So that's the tramcar as it is now. So that's um, Tramcar 107 um, has survived, but um, it's going to take quite a bit of restoration to uh, get it back to its uh, original state. So going forward um, into the, the new modern way of transport, the railless, um, so the first trolley buses owed much of their design to the tram car. Number 11 was built by Railless Limited in 1922, and is seen here loading on Old Square City Terminus on the Nietzsche's route. Um, <clears throat> it must have been rather an uncomfortable ride because um, they're solid rubber wheels. So I shouldn't imagine there was much comfort with these, uh, uh, a lot different, no different to the trams, because the trams had started to become very uncomfortable. And then, of course, we go to modern times. Um, being of the period that um, I, I'm going up to. So this was when, taking us to when the the fleet um, changed over in 1969 when the West Midlands uh, Passenger Transport Executive was founded and we lost our corporation transport. Personally, I think that 
the excuse was bus fares were going to be less and it was going to be cheaper. But I don't think we could have ever got any cheaper than what we'd already got with Birmingham. And Birmingham City Transport had reserved a whole registration uh, num uh, numbers um, of JOJ from 1 to 999. So that's JOJ247. That's JOJ417. Um, and that's JOJ. So, yeah, that's JOJ 32, so that's 2032. And then, of course, that was the last, they, they only waited time then that they got registration numbers in block was when they bought 100 buses and they had 100 numbers in consecutive. And of course, the registration number, the idea was that the registration number was the last three numbers of the fleet number. So all the JOJs um, were two. And then, so that would be 2247. Whoops, go back, press the button. To so normally uh, when I give a presentation, um, because it's in public, I, I put the books out uh, for my research. Uh, of course, I couldn't do that on Zoom. So these are the, um, the books that I got my um, research material from. So, thank you very much. I, I trust you're all still there. <laughs>